Well, this session brings us to the conclusion of the Apostolic Leadership Summit. And um, I think you can concur with me that God has faithfully guided every session of our gathering. There's multiple reasons why we came together. And God, in his ineffable way, has not only allowed us to release declarations and announce from a platform like this what he desires to do in the earth at this point in our journey in him, but he's also given us messages that can be applied to each one of our lives where we can go from here and be better people, or we could continue to graduate into the fullness of his image and likeness. And my prayer is that when you do leave this place, you would not just leave as being heroes of God's word, but doers. One of the greatest challenges we live in the age, in this present age, one of the greatest challenges of this present age is that our memories are very short. And sometimes from the point of just being on, at your seat to leaving the door, you can forget a lot of things that have been said. And by the time we go home, we can suffer from amnesia to the things we've had here. So it's of critical importance that we leave here Meditating, reflecting, musing, listening repeatedly to the sayings of God. Repetition is a fundamental prerequisite in the scriptures, and I find the scriptures could have been a much more smaller book. Uh, the genre and the catalogs that we have of, of books in the Bible could have been much shorter, smaller, if God removed all the repetitions. But but God reminds us through repetition and at times verbatim repetitions that we need to listen and continue to listen to what the Spirit is saying. One of my favorite references in the Bible is that God often speaks through an angel. And yes, we can argue that they are celestial beings but if we went to the literal meaning of the word angel, it could also be interpreted messenger. And there were human vehicles that God has used, the agency of humankind, so that through them, he could speak to the church. And God always needed a voice that he anointed with coals of fire so that they could be his herald, his communicator of the message. But ultimately, when an angel speaks on behalf of the Lord as his representative, you don't respond to the voice of the angel, but you, you respond to the voice of the spirit that speaks to the churches. He that has an ear to ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. There's the voice in the voice. And in the voices of all our speakers here, God used their voices to communicate his voice. The story of Samuel is a very good story about a young man who was mentored and fathered by Eli. Eli referred to him as my son. But Eli only, dis only discovered on the third occasion that God was using the intonation, the accent, of Eli to say Samuel, Samuel. And, and Eli had to then educate Samuel that the next time God uses my accent, you don't come running to me, but you go and say, speak, Lord, for your servant hear it. So I think it's of critical importance that we understand that there is a voice that will come into all our gardens in the cool of the day but we will need to know how to respond to that voice or hide from it. So let's not fight what the Spirit of God has been said, uh, said here.
Don't search out the scriptures and do not come with opinions that could contradict and cancel what the Spirit of God come, uh, says. You know, I was thinking as I'm listening to, uh, to the various sessions and statements made, and some statements may not fit my theological framework of reference. And partly I was thinking as I was listening to the speakers, that it doesn't fit because I've been trained theologically to analyze and to analyze critically. And so dialectical thinking has crept into biblical colleges and biblical thinking. And I thought how often God will, will raise a voice that challenges the status quo of your hermeneutical approach to the interpretation of scriptures. Uh, and that's what repentance is all about, that God will bring something from a completely different angle and provoke you to review the way you see it so that you can go to the next level. You can't change your mind unless it has been superimposed by a superior thought, something that is far better. And so God is speaking to us. And in my session last night, I told you that God is wanting to raise a people who would become the vehicle through which he would exp expand his rule and reign to the whole of creation, starting with planet Earth and eventually mutating to a level, developing to a level, or transforming to a level where we would rule over all things in Christ. That's where we're moving to. For us to be able to do that, yes, we want to teach people how to become skillful and to have the, the prowess so that we can be exact representations of Christ in every facet of human society. But we cannot do that without first fixing the vehicle. The agency of God is man. And, the, and God, if you really study the book of Genesis, especially the creation account, first chapter 1, chapter 2, and 3, you will find that God, invisible, unseen, unknown, literally concealed, being a mystery, chose to reveal himself, his image, his likeness, by creating the human race to be his body, his tabernacle. We are the temple of God. We are the means through which God moves in the earth. It's called corporeality. And in English, the word comes from two words, corpse, which Segi so aptly described for us, and real. God wants to become real in your corpse, in your body. Our biggest challenge is not the transformation of human society. Our challenge is the reformation of the church. And to reform the church, we have to bring it to a Christocentric focus, a Christ-centered focus. The blueprint is, as I told you last night, in Matthew chapter 16. And the blueprint is a confession of Peter, which also radically altered how God defined him. And he called him Peter. Petra, a rock, a stone, a building block, a living stone. Peter understood that later on when he spoke about living stones jointly fitted together that will constitute the assembling of the tabernacle of God. And we know the picture. We know the picture. Jesus and uh, uh, Jacob, one of our patriarchal fathers, who helps us to understand the eternal covenant that was given to the fathers in Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Uh, Jacob very powerfully understood when he had the ladder experience, the staircase re experience, that that which he rested his head on must become the pillar upon which God builds his house. And he took the stone that he slept on and he declared it not the pillow, but the pillar. And, and that rock, which is the church, is what is going to smite the kingdoms of the world. God cannot, while well, God can, but he chooses not, based upon divine protocol, 
not to work outside of the agency of the church. But yes, we, cannot, we can't define the church as an institutional form of religion, as when we come and sing our songs and take our offerings and preach our one hour or 20 minute sermons or whatever. The church is a people. And the church is a people who have a royal seed in them, the same seed that was, that was promised us in Genesis chapter three, that the seed of the woman will bruise the head of the serpent. That seed is the royal seed. That seed is the incorruptible seed. That seed in Galatians 3.16 is called the seed of Christ. We are also told that the seed of Abraham is Christ. And so we know that that seed is Christ. And Paul says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. In Galatians, he speaks about a travail until Christ be formed in every man. What God is looking for is not an institutional definition of church, but he's looking for a people who have the DNA of Christ, the sperma of God, the sperm of God, the God sperm called Christ is installed into our hearts. But you know the principle of seed. There is a germinal, a germinal principle locked up in a seed. It is out of the seed a plant grows, a plant de de develops. The germ of a plant is a seed. God wants to produce a people that will carry his image and likeness. The first Adam who had that mandate lost it. The last Adam, the second man, restored that when he brings us to conformity to the image and likeness of God. God predestined us to carry his eternal image and likeness. And the image and likeness of God is called the Son of God. And you cannot have the image and likeness of God called sonship unless you carry that sperm in your spirit called Christ. That, that is nurtured and governed by the Holy Spirit who uses the voices of angels to speak to you. These are messengers or keruks and so forth. And obviously there are various configurations of grace, different anointings that God uses within the fabric of those that are called to represent God to us. These are not our high priest in the sense of our demigods and cult figures and, and manipulative men who seek themselves. But these men operate as shepherds over God's sheep. These are men that never are interested in themselves. Self-interest does not govern them. They are not moved by money. They are called martyrs of Christ. These are individuals who have laid down their lives while they still live. Unlike, uh, unlike Judas who hanged himself and decapitated himself, which means suicide means, uh, by hanging means to cut your head off from the body, to disconnect your head from the body. He was dislocated from the body. But these men, the God, uh, God's raising, men and women I mean, that God's raising in this season, will come to, to sow and water the things of God into us, but ultimately God gives the increase. And my prayer is that when we leave here, we have to fix our churches. God's ultimate purpose is to have a corporate son in the earth. And that son who carries the spirit of Christ and all of the grace that God has put into that corporate son must become the image and likeness of God. God's glory can only be seen on his image. And it is in the sons that the Father is glorified. We are not here to magnify a man. You've heard about spiritual sonship and your commitment to a fathering grace. But the ultimate purpose of all fathers is never to bring sons to themselves but unto God. If the ultimate purpose is that they would get to know God as their divine father. That's the ultimate purpose. And so God is redefining the way we understand church. And most of our understanding of church has been kidnapped and hijacked by institutional and traditional and historical models of church. 
But God now is bringing us back to the basic definition of church, which is that the church is God's family. And God shows us that family in the Godhead, which is a Christological view of God. You cannot study theology to know God. You have to know the mystery Christ to understand God. And in Christ is the fullness of the Godhead. And if you study the Godhead, it's, it's the image. God is not trying to explain himself or define himself, but the only way he can define himself in the Godhead, the mystery of what we call the Trinity, is through a familial concept called Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And if you study the doctrine of Christ in, in 1 John chapter 5, uh, 2 John chapter, the last chapter, verse, chapter 1 verse 9 or whatever, the doctrine of Christ is the doctrine of the Father and the Son. Go and read it. And if you say you have Christ, you cannot deny the Father and the Son. And do not let whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. Next verse. And if anyone comes to you, any preacher, any guest speaker, any clever apostle who does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house, nor greet him. The doctrine of Christ is the doctrine of the Father and Son. And if we talk about apostles' doctrine, if an apostle does not bring Christ to your house, reject him. So we want to see by the Spirit how God could immaculately not only implant, impute that seed into our spirits. And that's come with our born-again experience. But that it will grow until the child becomes a son. Because the government is not given to a child. The government of God is given to a son. To establish and to order and establish it. And so I pray to God that when you leave here, we will raise up the family. The Bible says there's a beautiful portion of Scripture in Psalm 127, verse 1. A beautiful portion of Scripture. It says, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. And, and same verse. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays in vain. Let me give you my interpretation of this. This is a play with words. You know, the, the Hebrew language is not a literal language. It is, it is a narrative language. It's a language of pictures. It, it's storytelling. Um, like we have different forms of preaching. One of the forms of preaching that Jesus used was parabolic, picturous storytelling. And the Bible says here, unless the Lord builds. Actually, I think Jesus borrowed this verse. When he said, I will build oiko, oikos, family, nomio, radomio, uh, the superstructure of a family. I will build my church. And this says, unless the Lord builds. The word build is the word bana. The root to bana is the word ben. Unless the Lord builds by having sons. Ben means sons. Unless the Lord builds the family. The house is not a building. If you really go and study the Hebrew word for the temple, the Hebrew word like in Habakkuk and so forth, it's not temple as in a physical building, but it's actually the same word for family. Unless the Lord builds by having sons the family, whatever you build is in vain. So whatever you're building, if God sets you over a congregation to watch over it, to father it, to shepherd it, if you are not allowing the Lord to build sons in your family, but you're building membership, you're building crowds, you, build, you just want to attract people to yourself, whatever you do will be wood, stubble, and hay. It'll be building in vain. But look at the next thing, which means when families are built right in territorial locations called cities, then you don't have to have watchmen watching over the house, the city, like the way you want. Because if the family of God is built right, there will be walls and gates automatically established. 
And you know, according to Revelation 22, walls are apostles. And gates, the pearl, is an imagery of fathers, which is elders. So when you get apostles and elders like we had in the early church back, elders leading families and apostles leading whole regions, giving spiritual and apostolic oversight, when we bring that together, spiritual hedges and immunities established, and there is protection and prosperity from the attacks of the enemy. And then we will have the template of the new Jerusalem, the city of God, in every location in the earth. And we will not seek to migrate to the Middle East to have an experience with God. The city of God. And God is calling us now to come to a place of maturity. Unfortunately, it doesn't come by just being a child of God. Because the Bible tells us in Galatians chapter 3, the last few verses, and chapter 4, especially chapter 4, it says these words, chapter 4, verse 1, Galatians. So, just in conclusion with this, unless we build right, unless we build right, by building families of God, and you know, you don't have to be a rocket scientist, when God first gave me the revelation, my younger son was very small. Very small. And I went to him and I said to him, son, tell me, what is the governmental structure of a family? And he said to me, daddy, mommy, children. He said to me. I, 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 I scratched my head, head and pulled my hairs trying to work out what is the structure, the governmental structure of every congregation. And I discovered it's not apostles and prophets and evangelists and teachers and pastors. It's not all the manipulative titles we use today. But what Paul commanded people like Titus and Timothy and others to appoint elders in every place where there was a congregation of the Lord. In other words, place a representative father, a custodian, a guardian, uh, somebody who will act on behalf of God as the father over the family. It's called eldership. And that's how hedges are, are created around congregations. And when we do that, when we do it right, automatically there's a force field of protection that comes upon our regions. And even the enemy, with all his tricks and plans, he can't come near you because you have an invisible barrier around you. It's in this context that the Bible says, now I say that the hair, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from, from a slave, though he is master of all. Next verse. But is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the Father. And I want to say to all of us here today, we have to go back and make a major migratory transition in our minds. From stop seeing ourselves as some great man. You know, I have the privilege of traveling and I'm almost every week somewhere. And some people call me by the title Apostle, and I don't use the title on myself, but I, that's not because I'm being modest or trying to play around with it. I know my office in Christ, but I don't use the title. I'm secure in myself. I know my calling. I know that I can operate in that office. But, I, but when I come home, when I come home, I'm not coming home so that somebody can call me by the title. I'm coming home to my congregation or to my natural family, not to boast about things. I mean, I, go, so I come back sometimes from a great conference and they don't even ask me at home, how was your conference? You know how offensive that is? <laughs> you know, that's like puncturing your ego. When you can't tell them how many hundreds of thousands of people came and how many leaders you spoke to and all the breakthroughs that took place or who you hung out with and so forth. And they come and tell me, they want to talk to me about Manchester United. Can you believe it when I come home from such an anointed gathering? And when I go to church, I'm not interested in that title or what we did in the nations. I, I don't even like talking about it. I'm interested in being home because I know that God has placed me to represent him as a father. I'm not the father. But you can't receive the father if you don't receive the one who he places as his representation. 
And blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's what Jesus says. And your perception of the one who is placed over you. And you know, for me personally, the highest form of leadership in the church is not to be an apostle. Because the highest form of leadership in the Godhead is a father. That doesn't mean you call yourself Pope now. Or father somebody. It just makes you realize that. And at home, I have a policy. I mean, if my boys are all working now. But if we go to a restaurant, I won't let them pay. It's my responsibility of father to take care of them. As long as they're under my roof, I will take care of them. Yes, I won't make them parasites, but I'll take care of them. It's in me. And I've, I know that for many of us here. True fathering is not selfish. It's invisible fathering. It's representative fathering. It's wanting the best out of somebody else, not yourself. And God is saying that we need to now grow up. As long as you're a child, even though God's placed people over you, you're never going to be master of all. And if the kingdom is going to come, it can't come because we go around and do our prayer walks and make our declarations and, and call things into existence and then wonder why. We've claimed the cattle on a thousand hills, but we're fasting, not because we want to, but because we don't have me money to buy meat. And then we wonder why God has failed. He's not failed for any reason, but the vehicle called his son, which is the church. Made up of uh, being mentored and shaped in families, like Isaiah 68 verses 5 and 6 says. That he takes his solitary, his own, the word solitary is the same word that was used to describe Isaac. Your only begotten son. Your unique, one of its kind, special. God looks at us not as millions and billions of people in the body. He sees us as only one son. As his firstborn son in Christ. And then he takes you and he places you in a, in a family like he placed Jesus under Joseph and Mary. And Jesus had to submit to him, uh, just to, 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 to Joseph and Mary. At the age of 12, we learned that. Until God could claim back his son at the River Jordan. And I want to say to all of us here today that God is raising a family. He's taken you, the solitary, he's placed you. In a home, he's placed somebody over you, as, as we heard so beautifully today from John. And God is now expecting us to grow up. And you know what God said to Abraham, your seed will possess the gates of the enemy. You know the portion of scripture about, in, even in Psalms, uh, that, that the children are a blessing from the Lord, and they will occupy the gates of the city. So we are not going to take anything if the kingdom cannot come unless it comes to a corporate son. Or at least remnants of that, that, of that level of maturity that, that's scattered in the earth. And this is not manifest sons of God teaching. This is a reality that unless the image of God is restored in the earth, we will never see the quietening of the groan of creation who waits with abated breath, pregnant with expectancy, looking around even though the suns are in the earth, but they cannot be seen because they've not grown up. The child is in the earth, but not the sun. God is only made visible in sonship. That's why Jesus could say, if you saw me, you saw the Father. And Jesus didn't come to be a son. He was, I mean, let me put it the right way. He, the whole idea of him coming to be a son was to model to all of us how we should live in him. I mean, he was pre-existent. He was the eternal Logos. But why does God bring him down to the level of son? To show us how all of us should live to carry God's glory. So let's go from here. That's the point I want to make. Let's go from here. To be representatives of him. And you cannot do it unless you understand the sheep's anointing. The anointing of the sheep. The anointing of the sheep was that it was born to die. It was born to cover. It was born to substitute. It was born to represent. 
Even if you sit on a throne, that's why it's called the, the, the throne of God and the Lamb. It means that you cannot understand the throne of God if you don't see the representative nature of covering, of substitution, of vicariously representing people, of always wanting to, the other to be benefiting from you. In other words, self-interest is not in a sheep. He is led daily to the slaughter. God's called us to go from here as sheep, but in us is the spirit of the lion. You may be lambs amongst wolves, sheep amongst wolves. You may go into all the world, but let me tell you something. There is an eternal dimension, a vitality of life within you. No one can touch you, even though you are meek and humble and, and obedient and submissive to the purposes of God. The purposes of God will come to pass. So I've taken a decision. I'm not going to live for myself. I'm only going to live for others. I don't expect anything in return. I want to give and give and give. I want to bless and bless and bless. I want to lay down my life, and in that, immunity will come to others, and they can enjoy the blessings of what we would call this atoning grace, this covering anointing. It's not got to do with institutional forms of covering, but with how grace is spread abroad upon all people so that they can be protected. Will you go from here? with a sense of saying, we're going to represent God's kingdom by growing up. Amen. I quoted the scripture, woe is the land whose, whose king is a child, but blessed is the land whose king is a son of nobility. Would you go from here with a sense of saying, I'm going to grow up, I'm going to deal with things, and let me tell you how you'll know you grew up. And it's been highlighted in this con conference, it's been embellished into every session of this conference. There's only one way. When you come to a place where you can love unconditionally, and when you really love unconditionally, you'll give unconditionally. You'll bless unconditionally. And you will never look for anything for yourselves because there's no self-interest in love. Even if you don't get another thank you for the rest of your life, it doesn't matter. You will always be blessing and giving. If we can perfect love, we will perfect sonship. So I pray that God's grace and peace will go with you and that his mercies will be with you all the days of your life. You receive the apostolic blessing from John Ellie, so I would not try to repeat it. Amen. Are you blessed? Are you anointed? Are you going to represent his kingdom? His reign and rule comes through you wherever you are. Be a good representation of the kingdom of God. Amen. Give him praise. Give him glory.